the episode. I have no clue, but I don't know. Someone does. Someone out there in the world does. Welcome to the show where we talk about theology in a practical way and ask, constantly feel like I'm doing. Just constantly asking, why? what is going on with all these people? Like these, these pastors, these theologians, if you're new to the channel, the idea behind underdog theology is that it's just us. You know, for me, I'm here in my basement talking to a camera and a microphone, and we're talking about the big dogs. We're talking about the people with influence and just trying to ask, like, what do they mean? And what's, what's actually going on here? And uh, we've got some questions to ask of the Southern Baptist Convention today, because the Southern Baptist Convention is the biggest denomination in North America, 50,000 churches, all right? Like, again, 50,000. Not like 5,000, 50. That's crazy. It's a crazy amount of churches. And uh, they're constantly like trying to figure it out. It is interesting to watch from afar as a Baptist. Like I'm not a Southern Baptist, but I am a Baptist. And so watching it from afar is interesting, but also kind of scary because the Southern Baptist Convention has so much influence. Again, 50,000 churches. So they have influence not just in the Baptist world, but in evangelicalism as a whole. You can see that through all the different Southern Baptist leaders or former leaders who are now in charge of different institutions and, uh, you know, having all kinds of influence there. So, um, Elijah, I really hope not. I hope that the stream is installing for everybody. Um, it should, should be going okay. <laughs> Don't make me nervous about my technology. I want to say welcome to all the people who have been watching uh, this last weekend. Oh my goodness. I just did a stream because some of my subscribers asked about uh, shiny happy people. And oh my goodness, uh, sitting at like 21,000 views right now and continues to grow. So if you have come over to uh, the underdog bandwagon, uh, welcome. You're welcome here. Uh, we, we talk about things in a kind and I don't know, sometimes, sometimes sarcastic way, <laughs> but we try to be as kind as we can, as we deal with all these things, try to be as biblical as we can. But also again, sometimes you just got to ask what the heck is going on. So again, with the Southern Baptist convention, the meeting is next week and they're left with all kinds of stuff, uh, all kinds of stuff going on. Oh man, I've having a couple people being like, "There's the streams having issues." Um, see that someone was saying, "Not, not for me," but it is, uh, it is buffering. I'm not sure what I can do about that. Ecam might be having some issues. Usually, we're pretty good. I'm just gonna roll with it. Sorry if it loses some quality, but uh, the Southern Baptist Convention—they're having their meeting next week in New Orleans. And uh, it's a Baptist thing, just meetings all the time, meetings about everything, meetings trying to figure out what to do about all different kinds of issues. Now, over the last couple of years, if you're familiar with what's been going on with the Southern Baptist Convention, you know it's been all about abuse. It's been all trying to figure out what is this denomination going to this convention. Now, uh, according to some... There was a video that was put out uh, about a month ago now, I think, where uh, some guy in the Southern Baptist Convention, I don't know, some, maybe he was a professor somewhere, but he he was talking about how there's 170 female pastors. So 170, <gasps> you know, gasp, we need to do something about this huge problem. And um, it's, it's, it's not it's 170 out of 50,000. It's like 0.01% or something like that, 0 0.05, something like that. I did the math a while ago. Um, I'm, not, I'm not great at math, uh, but I did the math, and it's not that big of a problem. But now you have Rick Warren, and I've talked about this a few times in the last couple of weeks because I feel like it's really important. Rick Warren has decided to make his ousting at the Southern Baptist Convention like the primary issue for, for the annual meeting. Now, again, I've talked about how I understand why Rick Warren is upset about being thrown out of the convention when, you know, he spent a long time in it and uh, has been, you know, at least according to him, planting thousands of churches. Not sure if that's accurate, but that's what he said. Uh, but he's worked really hard within the convention to, to do a lot 
as far as planting churches and resourcing pastors and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So I understand why he would be upset. But the last couple of weeks, he's just been talking about how he is, you know, making this push and he's going to address the floor at, at the uh, annual meeting. And it's just frustrating, to be honest, because you have a guy that's claiming to be like, oh, I'm standing up for women. And he doesn't see what's happening. All right. Southern Baptists are now like there are different sides of this thing, drawing away the attention from the main problem. They're, the main problem in the Southern Baptist Convention is not female pastors. The main problem in the Southern Baptist Convention is abuse and how to handle it and what to do about it and how to make sure that one pastor doesn't just go to another church like the frickin' Roman Catholic Church. Like, it's, it's getting to that point. And, like, there's all kinds of investigations that are going on, and they're talking about wanting to have a database, and apparently... That's the worst thing ever, even though they had it for years, for years, and they just didn't tell anybody, but now it's a really bad thing. And uh, so there's, there's all kinds of division that's happening on this issue. And here comes Rick Warren to throw his, you know, influence around and to say, no, let's stop talking about that. He's not necessarily saying that, but he's saying, let's focus on me. Let's focus on on why I'm getting kicked out, because I represent a large chunk uh, of Southern Baptists who, again, 170 churches, like that's not that many, but he's saying like that he represents even more than just that 170, and uh, you know that this is a huge issue, and if he's going to get thrown out, then all these other people are going to get thrown out. All right, well, Rick Warren has decided to now uh, not just, you know, put out tweets and things like that. Now he's writing letters, open letters, and everyone's publishing it, and they're all sharing it. And so I thought it'd be interesting for us to take a look at that before we dive into one of the more interesting things to happen in the Southern Baptist world in a little bit. Uh, but let's let's take a look. Um, and so this was a letter that he sent them on June 2nd, and uh, they decided to run it as... Uh, uh, an opinion piece. So let's just read for a little bit. As a Southern Baptist pastor with multi-generations of pastors in my family, my life has been shaped and uh, nurtured by the SBC. I'm writing this open letter for two reasons. First, I'm deeply concerned about our denomination's 17 years of decline and the loss of a half million members just last year. No denomination could sustain that kind of loss. Second, many have asked me to explain why Saddleback Church is appealing an executive committee ruling at our annual meeting in recent uh, uh, in New Orleans in two weeks. Uh, the Southern Baptist is a mosaic of many kinds of Baptist tribes who came together to cooperate on the Great Commission. We are uh, General Baptist, the original founding Baptist of 1609, Revival Baptist, Fundamentalist Baptist, Calvinist Baptist, and many other varieties of Baptists. All right. So I would I just want to point out here he's wrong. He's wrong right off the bat. And again, I'm not someone who hates Rick Warren, okay? Uh I defended him when he went to the floor and was pretty emotional and talking about getting kicked out and all of that. Like it seemed like grandstanding a little bit with the numbers and things and I've learned now from him that that's just what he does. He just constantly talks about the numbers. Um but I've defended him before, and I just, this is just wrong. It's misrepresenting what's happening in the Southern Baptist Convention. The Southern Baptist Convention isn't declining like that, all right? Um, and he, he talks about if this continues, there won't be a Southern Baptist Convention, which uh, if things are left the way they are, I, I agree. There won't be a Southern Baptist Convention uh, in 20 years. Um if there isn't change that happens, but it's not because of this, this idea of 17 years of decline, that's because they inflated the numbers like crazy back in the day. <laughs> like when they were, they would, anyone who came into their church, they would count as a member, you know, like they, like they have a very low view of membership as a whole. Um, and so they, they would just say anyone who comes in, yeah, you're a member and everyone gets saved and everyone gets baptized and they bloated the numbers. And now 
because we have technology and because things are there, tools are around to help us to actually keep these numbers in check and a little bit closer to reality, the numbers are naturally coming down. And so he's talking about like this decline. Is there a decline? Sure. There's decline, just like there's decline across most denominations right now. Um, but it's not like some crazy thing that's happening in the Southern Baptist Convention. Like it seems like it when you just look at the numbers as like a whole. But once you actually start talking to churches, they're the same size. A lot of them uh, are the same size or around that same size uh, as far as their membership goes. Maybe like the visitors who were constantly coming, maybe they're not coming back because, you know, like the pandemic happened and a lot of people were like, is church that necessary? And if you weren't really involved in church, then maybe not. So uh, a lot of people just like the the people who weren't really dedicated, they left. So there is some decline, but it's not anything close to what's happening here. So he's he's making it out to be like, oh, this is the end of Southern Baptists. And it's not. And, um, but you know, if he stays in, I guess that's going to change everything. Uh, I did a, I did a thing on my movie channel today about Tom Cruise making people show his movie in IMAX because he alone could save, uh, the movie industry. Like this is for the good of all movie industries like this. This is kind of what it seems like with Rick Warren here. <laughs> it's just like, really like in your face, it's, it, you need me. Uh, and I guess those who he represents, because there's so many of them, but he won't actually give an actual number on it. Uh, so uh, let's let's uh, let's talk about this. From the start, our unity has always been based on a common mission, not a common confession. For the first 80 years of the SBC, we did not even have a confession because the founders were adamantly opposed to having one. You can read the founding documents at uh, WWE. W. I've never said that. Like I haven't said that in years. So it sounded so weird coming out of my mouth. Uh, whatever. SBCstand.com. They knew we never could get a hundred percent of Baptists to agree on hundred percent on 100% of every interpretation of scripture. Okay. Um, Rick Warren is painting an interesting picture about the history of the Southern Baptist convention, uh, which as a whole, I think the Southern Baptist convention has a lot of potential for good and has done so much evangelism. The IMB, the NAMB, these are amazing institutions that have done so much work, uh, for the cause of Christ. So I want that set up front. Um, but let's, let's be real. Southern Baptists are Southern Baptists because there was a civil war because there was the issue of slavery and they decided that they weren't going to be like the Northern Baptists and they were going to support Southern ideals. So like for them, for him to be like, Oh, we didn't have it. And that was great. Everything was great back then when we didn't have to agree on everything. It's like the main thing that held you guys together was slavery. I'm sorry, but that's, that's just history. You could look it up. Like, I, I don't mean to, like, it doesn't mean everything that would ever come from them is awful. This isn't cancel culture. I'm just saying that's facts. That's history. So, like, it's a weird, weird move for Rick Warren to be like, oh, let's get back to the good old days of when we didn't have to agree on everything. And he's painting it like there wasn't a confession. There were, there was a statement of faith that they had to agree on. It just wasn't the Baptist faith and message. So it's just, it's odd. It's really odd the way he's describing things. And I actually think it's, it's deceitful. Um, that's why every version of the Baptist faith and message has called itself a consensus of opinion. And it repeatedly warns us it is not a creed to be used to enforce doctrinal uniformity or exclude members of our denominational family. You own family members often, uh, your own family members often hold opposing opinions, but you don't disown them for that. You still love them in spite of disagreements. Yes, but consensus does actually mean that like that's that it's agreement. Like it might not mean that it has to be 100%, but it does mean that you have to have at least main things agreed on. And the idea of female ordination is explicitly said in the Baptist faith and message to have consensus on. 
And if you don't have that consensus, then what what do you actually have in common? That you're Christians? Like, he's arguing for just being able to mostly hold to things. But it's like, okay, well, if you say that this part that's explicitly said in the Baptist faith message, like, this is what they believe. If you go like, oh, we can we can have a little bit of disagreement on this part. Well, why can't you have a little bit of disagreement on baptism? Like, it's the same argument. Like, you're not, he doesn't argue for, this is so much of a lesser thing that we shouldn't have to argue on. That's not his argument. His argument is that the Baptist faith and message isn't a binding document. Well, if it's not a binding document, then what the heck are you doing? <laughs> like, why do you exist? <laughs> what, like, okay, the, you're just Christians getting together? Well, then anyone could be a part of the Southern Baptist Convention, right? If it's that bland and it doesn't have any uh, like rigid outline to it of where the borders stop for this thing, then anyone could be a part of it. It's, it's odd argument after odd argument in this article. Uh, let's, let's keep on going here. I want to get to these points that he says. In fact, for 178 years, Southern Baptists have agreed to disagree on dozens and dozens of doctrinal differences so we could cooperate for the gospel. Obviously. <laughs> you can... No, I don't understand like where he's coming from of like, oh, you could disagree with things. Uh-huh. But the main things, and what you say the main things are, you need to have a consensus. Agreement. That's what consensus means. <sighs> so weird. Uh, the current ruling of the executive committee will open a Pandora's box of unintended consequences unless we reject it. It will fundamentally destroy our historic Southern Baptist distinctives upon which the convention was organized by our founders. It will change the basis of our cooperation, change the basis of our identity. Is it change? Is it change or is that just the way that they wrote the document and agreed upon and said, so we're going to stick to it. It's not change. It's like, again, Rick Warren is the one who changed. He said his theology was like at least similar to complementarianism. And now he's the one who's changed. And he's even said it over the last few years. He's changed. So it's it's not changing anything within the Southern Baptist Convention to hold to the Baptist faith message that was agreed upon by everybody centralize power in the executive committee and take away autonomy from the churches. I will agree with that point. I think that I've said this before. I think he does have a point about how it happens, that it should be a vote by the the churches. And it shouldn't be a vote behind, like of uh, just a group of individuals at the top. But again, I'm a congregationalist. So like that, let, read that into everything. But they claim to be. Uh, turn our confession into a creed, which Baptists always have opposed. We all grew up with the slogan, we have no book but the Bible, and we have no creed but Christ, which is one of the worst slogans of all time. Because again, it's just, all right, well, what about your interpretation of the Bible? Like, that's what the creeds are for. It's not to replace the Bible. It's so dumb. Like that statement, I've heard it so many times, and it's every time it's just shocking. And this guy just got in as like the the honorary... What is it? Oh, I forget. The, it's not honorary president, but chancellor. Honorary chancellor of Spurgeon's College. Like, he knows what he's saying is dumb. <laughs> and it's he's just making really bad arguments. So he's just, you know, talking about basically, uh, you know, that the Bible is their authority and not not this document. So let's let's just finish up with this thought. This is a vote to affirm our founding documents which insists that our unity is to be based on giving total submission to Christ in our deeds and not based on mental submission to man-made creeds. Hand me a Bible and I'll sign that as my authority. Hand me a Bible and I'll sign that as my authority. The Bible is Baptist sole authority. But again, your interpretation of it, it's fine. Everyone says they believe the Bible. This is the problem with Biblicists. Like, especially when you get into like stuff like Calvinism and Arminianism and everyone's like, oh, well, I just believe the Bible. Cool. So does everybody. Like everybody believes the Bible. So what do you actually mean by that? Take a position. 
take an interpretation and say, this is my interpretation of the Bible. And that's what Baptists have done forever. Like I'm a 1689 Baptist, not one of the jerky ones, but I am one of the like normal ones, I would like to think at least. Uh, and so I affirm the 1689 Second London Baptist Confession. That's my confession. The Southern Baptists, like some of them have different confessions that they say that they're creedal, uh, creedal to, but um, you know, it's the Baptist faith message. It's the revised version. And they say that's the founding document for, for them. That's, that's what holds them together. That's their interpretation of Scripture. And that interpretation of Scripture explicitly says that they don't have female pastors. No, there's other things like, you know, different directors and different things. You can argue about those things. But what Rick Warren is arguing for, he's not going to win. And honestly, when I look at this stuff, I just, there's a part of me that just gets mad because it's just, you're stealing away so much attention. You're using your influence. He's so influential. Like there's no one who has a platform like Rick Warren. And instead of, you know, talking about the main issue that people are trying now to be like, oh, there's 170 female pastors, witch hunt, you know, like let's, let's, oh, we need to focus over there. Let's not focus over here on that, that, uh, that list of offenders. Let's this. Nope. We, we don't want that. We don't want a database. Let's focus on that. And he's falling right into that trap and he's like making it even worse. <laughs> it's just like you, he, he's got to know that he's stealing away attention. Like, or I don't know, maybe he's just so oblivious that he just doesn't get it. And I'm not trying to like say he's dumb or something like that. He's a very intelligent person, but maybe he just doesn't understand the ramifications of him stepping up like this and being like, I'm going to argue for this. And I get, once again, there's a personal background, right? Like I'm sure he wants to belong to the Southern Baptist convention. I understand that, but he's the one who changed the Southern Baptist convention didn't change. And he's stealing away attention on something that is too important. Like, it really should be the only thing that Southern Baptists are concerned about. It should be the only big thing. And the thing about an institution as big as this that has so much going on that, like, it's hard to get anything done at the annual meeting. All right. I've watched it for years. Like, anytime they have something that they specifically want to get done, it is a fight tooth and nail, even when it's something that's pretty benign. Like it's, it, it's hard to move a huge organization like that. And for him to be like, oh, we need to focus here. And that's already what some people on the other side who don't want to talk about abuse at all have been doing. It's just like, come on, you're stealing away attention and you're falling into a trap and you need to just stop. Let this be the main issue. Come back next year. Come back next year where you can have those arguments. That argument about female pastors isn't going away anytime soon. It's going to be a problem for a couple years yet, and then there'll be some big whoop to do about it. But it's it's kind of just a shame that they're focusing so much on this issue right now. We're a week away and no one's talking about what they're going to do about guideposts and what a solution might be for removing guideposts because there's so much talk about getting rid of them but there's no talk about who they're going to take over. It's a stalling tactic. Like it's going to be, Oh, we need to find someone. Let's vote that we find someone get a committee to go and fight, find some people. And then it'll just fade. It'll fade into obscurity. It'll be the next headline. And it's just going to be a shame. I see Joe's in here. And what did, what did he say? Uh, the second Lentini confession. Yes. Yes. It's a great one. It's, the first one was a little rough. I got to admit but the second one, that's, that's what really won people over. No one, no one was won over. All right. No, let's continue talking about Southern Baptist convention because this is kind of shocking. All right. Willie Rice came out with a letter today and Willie Rice is an interesting figure because, uh, well, he was, he was bound to like, he, he was wanting to run for, for president a couple years back. Was it last year or the year before? Uh, and then there was all kinds of stuff about a deacon that he had at his church and how he had a background and some like some form uh, of misconduct. And and he was basically out. He was he was out. 
Uh, but now I guess he's on the side of the people that he was actually going up against. Like he was brought to the forefront as like the candidate to oppose the conservative Baptist network. And today there's this letter of how he's going to nominate Mike Stone. Uh, so you can see it here. It's the statement on his church's website. In just a few days at our Southern Baptist convention meeting in New, uh, New Orleans, I will nominate Mike Stone to the office of SBC president. Such an announcement would have been unthinkable for both of us a short time ago. I wish the status quo was an option. It's not. Two years ago, when Mike ran for SBC president and lost a narrow election, I enthusiastically supported my friend Ed Litton. I rejoiced when Ed won. I didn't know Mike was, uh, but disagreed with him on several issues and especially felt concern over the conservative Baptist network. I found some of their voices to be overly divisive and unnecessarily uh, caustic. Uh, I strongly support both of our mission boards, love their leaders, and believe then, and still do, that their overwhelming consensus of Baptist leaders are rock solid in their uh, biblical convictions. Conservative, which one means biblical fidelity and moral conviction, is not an adjective to describe a subset of our people. It's who we are. As Mike uh, said before the Nashville convention, there were no liberals uh, being nominated. Okay. Uh, I am not a part of the CBN. I do not endorse everything they have said or written, but neither do I think every concern they have expressed can be ignored and summarily dismissed. Uh, Mike and I have spoken at length about this. Mike does not represent the CBN. And if elected, Mike will not be uh, CBN president, he will be the SBC president and he will serve us all. We'll come back to that part. <laughs> In the last months, I've come to know Mike Stone uh, on a personal level. I have found him to be a man of courageous conviction, a pastor with a shepherd's heart, blah, 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 blah. He's a great human being. I will support him and hope he is elected. Why the change? Yeah. Why now? I have reluctantly but clearly come to believe that our convention is facing an existential crisis that could irreparably damage our cooperative work. I'm not sure if on the present course, the cooperative program survives much longer. Uh-oh. <laughs> Mike has long been a strong supporter of our cooperative work. In the 20 full years of Pastor Mike's tenure at Emmanuel, the church has given an average of 8.6%, blah, 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 blah. He loves missions. All right, here we go. The sexual abuse reform movement began with the best of intentions, at least for most of us. But I now believe that the movement, as currently engineered, threatens the very fabric of our fellowship. That's Those are big words. Threatens the very fabric of our fellowship. For reasons I've written about before, I was an enthusiastic uh, proponent of this reform movement. At long last, Southern Baptists were having an open conversation to deal with the issues. I've already said it, but I'm going to try it for YouTube of SA and possess the will and momentum to act. Like so many, I supported such efforts, believing we were going to address child SA and predators. But where we're at isn't what I signed up for. Oh, this is awful. I didn't sign up for left-wing feminist critical theory cancel culture politics. I didn't sign up for leaked emails, taped conversations, endless lawsuits, and character assassinations. A movement that should have united Southern Baptists to attack a problem has instead divided us into attacking one another. Godly believers have been maligned and attacked... Maligned? An attack is somehow supportive of SA and of SA uh, ers, uh, simply because they advocate a different approach to dealing with this critical issue, a different approach. I will nominate Mike Stone because Mike is one of the few people who understands what has gone wrong and knows how to write the direction. Mike is a SA abuse survivor. That's redundant. Uh, he knows firsthand the horror of such a violation. He also knows what it feels like to be uh, unfairly attacked. He is one of the few guys I know who possess the strength 
to stand in this current moment and the wisdom to know what to do. Oh, man. Mike has assured me he will build on the work of SA reform and will lead Southern Baptists in a united effort to address this issue. The very best thing Southern Baptist churches can do to protect those under our care is to equip our churches and our pastors with the necessary skills and training to prevent SA. Does, does anyone think that, that, that they don't have that? Like that there isn't training available for these Southern Baptist, like where are these Southern Baptist pastors? Are they like on a deserted Island with no internet? Like, do I'm sorry, but is, is that really what, what the big problem is, is that they don't have resources to look up when there's abuse and know that maybe they should deal with it. Like this is 2023, yo. Like we're not talking about 1980 and we don't know what abuse is. This is ridiculous. If the convention chooses to empower the next president to appoint another task force to continue the work of SA reform, Mike has been assured, uh, Mike has assured me he will only appoint people who identify with Southern Baptists who care about the work and health of our churches and will guide us. Everything's going to be in-house. This is awful. Um, I'm getting angry. <laughs> Uh, who identify with Southern Baptists who care about the work and health of our churches and will guide us to a thoughtful approach that can unite our churches, not divide them. The work of SA reform will not be torpedoed. It will be accomplished, and it will be accomplished in a way that unites us and follows appropriate legal guidelines. Mike will not advocate approaches that can, uh, circumvent legal protocols and violate our ecclesiology or our theology. <sighs> Willie! What the heck, Willie? Um, all right. Obviously, Willie is conservative in his politics, and that is coming into play in this. When he starts going into this feminist agenda and cancel culture and all that, and I understand that he went through the ringer. Like, there were all kinds of accusations toward him. So I get that this is personal for him and that he probably feels a certain way after being accused of things. Whether that's right or wrong, I don't know because I'm not part of the situation. But I get that you would feel that way. But is that reality of what's going on with the task force? Obviously not. The task force hasn't even done anything. No, no one is being maligned. If, like, honestly, when he said that, I'm thinking Johnny Hunt. Like, I'm trying to think of the people who have actually been, like, maligned, maligned. Maybe he's talking about Mike Stone and some of the things that were said about how he confronted uh, one of the uh, um, survivors uh, in front of the stadium at one of the meetings. I don't know if that was last year or the year before when he confronted Hannah Kate. Um, but, like, maybe he's talking about that. But my mind immediately goes to, like, Paige Patterson. Are we talking Paige Patterson? You really want to get on that train? and be like supportive of Paige Patterson. You want to hop on the train of supporting <laughs> Ow, my ears. Sorry, Sam. <laughs> my bad. My bad. <laughs> Just Willie. Uh, but oh man. But who who are you talking about? You talking about Paige Patterson, you're talking about Johnny Hunt and you really want to be on that train. All right, you could ride that train to the end of the line because it's coming up real short, pal. Um, there, there is all kinds of stuff that's been said about them. Now, um, <laughs> will Mike Stone do anything about abuse? Yes, of course. Like, I'm not saying that Mike Stone is like Satan, okay? Uh, he is a Christian pastor, and he cares about Jesus, and he has a very different perspective on how to handle abuse than what I think is reasonable, and logical. Uh, and the main thing is his issue of autonomy, that you have the Southern Baptist Convention telling autonomous churches what to do and holding their pastors accountable. I get it. I also believe in the autonomy of the local church, the self-governing of the local church. I believe that's biblical, that another church can't dictate what another church does. That being said, 
you already have a document that you say has to be followed, right? All of these guys who are talking about, you know, how we need to be careful about autonomy, they're they're the ones who voted to get Rick Warren out. You know, they're the ones, if that vote comes up, they're going to say, nope, we're going to deny that appeal. Obviously, they're okay with having at least some standard that dictates whether a church is in friendly cooperation with the Southern Baptist Convention. But here, they're saying abuse doesn't fall into that. Abuse isn't that important. It's not a crucial issue when it comes to this stuff. They would say, of course, that it is important. Like, I don't want to paint them you know, in a wrong way or whatever. Um, but it's not that important. It's not as important as female pastors. It's far more important, far more important to deny, uh, this, this issue and to say like, Oh, we're going to, we're going to resource. We're going to equip. That's how we put it. We're going to equip them as if again, like that's the problem for the Southern Baptist pastors. They just don't know what to do. Yes, they do. They have a Bible. It's pretty dang clear what to do with abuse and how to handle it within the church. It just takes courage and it takes accountability because you think, all right, well, I don't think it was that big of a deal and it doesn't seem like it's going to happen again. So I think we're in the clear and we don't need to muddy up the name of the church and, you know, deal with all this and ruin someone's family and all that kind of stuff. And next thing you know, this person's been doing this thing, this horrible action for years. And people knew about it three years ago. Look at the shiny, happy people documentary where people knew about it three years ago. They didn't let anything happen because oh, they, he was just curious about the about his sisters. And then no one. Uh, also, Jim Bob uh, and Michelle, the mega church that they talked about was Ronnie Floyd's church. So I'm just saying there's stuff. Um, it this. This is so wrong. Willie is taking a very wrong approach in this, and I understand why he's doing it that he doesn't want people wrongly accused. I understand that. But the the database isn't about just saying, oh, this person said that they abused this other person. There there could be guidelines that you put into place of what it means to be credibly uh, credibly accused. And they've already done a lot of that work, by the way. The task force has already done that. But you can put in more things to where it's not just, oh, you get told a story about someone next thing you know, they're on a list and they can't get a job. All of this is just deeply depressing, to be honest. Uh, Southern Baptists, I am fully convinced they're not going to do the right thing next week. Pray for them. Pray for them that, you know, Bart Barber uh, wins again, uh, that, you know, abuse reform can continue. uh, But pray for them because even if that happens, the convention will split. Like, that's what Willie is trying to avoid. Like, he's trying to avoid the cooperative program, and he's thinking of missionaries and church planters and different uh, institutions that that are started by or funded by the cooperative program. And he doesn't want to see those disappear, and I understand that. But this issue is too important to just say, oh, yeah, let's let's give people booklets. Let's give people booklets, and, and that'll that'll solve everything. The only way that abuse stops is with accountability. Only way. And we know that. And a lot of times it doesn't stop until someone calls the police and like the police have to get involved. And it could have been stopped without the police. They could have gone to the police and not have to be found out. They could have been told. It's it's awful. So, um, now again, I'm not saying Mike Stone is a horrible person or that Willie Rice is a horrible person. I'm just saying they have a very different perspective on this. And I think that's incredibly flawed and it's going to derail everything. Uh, it just proves to me is too steep of a hill, uh, for the Southern Baptists to be able to get over with, uh, the necessary steps to stop abuse, uh, at least grand scale stop abuse. So it's just going to continue. And if it does continue, I think it's time for people to head out. So there's going to be an exodus from the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, either, you know, Barber will be reelected and continue these things, or, you know, maybe someone else will be elected and continue those things. Or if they don't, and Mike Stone is, he wins, which I don't actually think that he will. 
you know, you're going to see people be like, oh, this was it. We gave it one last shot and we failed. And, and so we're leaving. And so there's going to be a divide, a huge divide in the Southern Baptist Convention. Maybe not this year, but in the near future over this issue. And like I said, I am fully convinced now. I wanted to give them like the benefit of the doubt that they would do the right thing once they were pointed to it and just doesn't seem like that's going to happen. They're too wrapped up in politics to be able to figure out that all of that is just a facade and uh, that they actually just need to deal with abuse. It's, it's pretty simple, but apparently not. So it's frustrating. Now, uh, I watched a documentary, like I said earlier, uh, this, this weekend and did a stream on Friday about shiny, happy people. And uh, I want to talk about someone else who is talking about this thing. Our good buddy, uh, Dale Partridge. Dale Partridge decided that he was going to, you know, tweet. And, uh, you know, we've been waiting for two and a half weeks now. I think actually, I think Wednesday it will be three weeks uh, since Dale Partridge said that he was going to come out with uh, podcasts and um, blog posts about his academics and some of the stuff that I accused him of like the deceitful practices that he used like way back, like eight months. And then crisis, the cure did it just a couple weeks ago. You guys remember me talking about that, doing that stream. Um, well, we're still waiting and, uh, haven't heard much from him. Uh, but he did decide that he wanted to tweet about shiny, happy people. Uh, I don't know if it's because my video, my stream got 21,000 views and he seems to like watching people's stuff anyways. Um, but 21,000 views. And I talked about him in it, um, because it's pretty dang close. His stuff and Bill Gothard's stuff is really close. Um, but he decided to tweet this with hashtag shiny, happy people. Maybe, maybe he's just trying to get followers. Um, but he decided to tweet this thread that wasn't actually a thread. Uh, it's just one of those things where you pay so much money and you get to have a blog, I guess, hosted by Twitter, which is super frustrating. But here we go. Uh, so Dale Partridge says, many years ago, we joined a church that was semi-influenced by people like Bill Gothard and Michael Pearl. A few things about these communities. So he was in it. <laughs> that's, that's what that means. He was in it. Number one, uh, they are Arminian. Oh and openly reject the doctrines of grace. As a result, they have no grace. <laughs> um, I'm a Calvinist. I've said it so many times on this channel. I'm a Calvinist and this is ridiculous. Like, okay, you're not a Calvinist, so you have no grace. You have none. You have no grace. That's not how it works. What are you talking about? As a result, they have no grace. Many of those in those communities are not born again, but are more moralists. I wouldn't say most, but I would say that's, that's more than people would want, obviously. Um, but no grace. What? Number two, they believe you can lose your salvation and therefore create rules and behaviors to teach you how to keep it. Obedience is not driven by a motiva uh, motive to please God, but to maintain your good standing and love before him. This produces a culture of legalism. Oh, does it? This is so weird. <laughs> it's, he's saying all these things as if it's not about himself <laughs> and, and everything that he's attached to with Moscow and, uh, you know, right response ministries and all these different things. Number three, they view any form of uh, natural birth control as sinful and lacking trust in God. As a result, families have many children uh, but wives are overwhelmed and the quality of family, sorry, it's really small family, uh, discipleship is poor. They are multiplying, but they are not fruitful. Um, yeah, I, I kind of actually agree with that. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, it's kind of, kind of an obvious one, but let's see what else he had to say too. Uh, number four, they discipline children by fear and law not love and grace because they have not experienced grace. Again, like if you're an Arminian, like you've experienced grace. That's ridiculous. This guy, again, this guy became a Calvinist in 2020 and started talking as if he was an expert on it right off the bat. Um, 
Uh, they cannot extend it to others. They produce obedient children who at the heart despise their parents. I don't know about despise, but there's definitely fear tactics used in this. Uh, number five, they are patriarchal, but they are not practicing biblical patriarchy. <laughs> oh, this was, this was maybe my favorite thing I've read in a long time. I was wondering when he was going to get to it as I was reading it this morning. It's like, cause Bill Gothard, like it's, it's patriarchy. It, it really is. But Dale Partridge argues for patriarchy and he's basically like, uh, yeah, it's patriarchy, but it's not like the good one <laughs> as if like there is a good one. It's just, Oh, uh, like we're page. Yes. We believe in patriarchy, but not that patriarchy. Okay. Yeah. Cause there's, there's a difference. Men rule with little love. That's the problem. That's the problem. Men rule with little love. You know, you need to be a little bit more loving in how you exercise complete authority over your wife. Um, men rule with little love and often miss the mercy and compassion required of good shepherding. Um, I don't want to get into details because people have like I've I've had so many people reach out about Dale Partridge and tell me stories and things, and I will just say. Uh, he needs to look in the mirror on that one. All that said, if any of that is true, all that said, not all is bad. They homeschool their children well, have good work ethics. Men and women do not complain and whatever. When? <laughs> they don't complain ever? Okay. Uh, and they produce moral children. Moral children. <laughs> this is the way you word things. It's so weird. However, they lack the love of the gospel. The love of the gospel. Without that, at the heart of their lives, everything else becomes distorted. By God's mercy, we left the church in 2017, came to an understanding, the beauty of grace, and it has changed our family and parenting in dramatic ways. To him be the glory. Um, I got a couple questions about this. Uh, he has claimed to be a pastor. Um since before 2017 and i'm fairly confident given like the chronology that he's laid out he was pastoring a house church in 2017 so is he talking about like he's talking about like we were involved at a church was it his church <laughs> like, i'm just asking a question <laughs> like uh, because he's so weird about his past and like laying out things because he's trying to hide his education stuff. Uh, or at least, oh, I don't know if he's trying to hide it necessarily, but he's obviously using wording and language to avoid the conversation about how he hasn't finished his education. But I'm also pretty sure like in 2017, he was a pastor of his own house church. So I'm, I'm a little, like maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm wrong. And he just wasn't, he was just at a church, but I'm fairly confident that's what was going on. So if that's the case, then it's like, what are you even talking about? Um, but also like all of this is just ridiculous to talk about. Like, I think what he's trying to do is differentiate himself and Bill Gothard. But the problem is like you, you see it here. He doesn't talk about headship at all in, in this whole thing, which is the main issue. And the reason why he doesn't is because it's the exact same ideology. Like Bill Gothard and Dale Partridge and Doug Wilson and all these guys that are for biblical, biblical patriarchy as if that was a thing. Like they, they're all cut from the same theological branch as far as this view on headship. And maybe they don't use the dumb umbrellas picture, but like it's the same exact stuff. And so what he's trying to do is saying like, oh, we're the good ones. Like, yeah, we, we sound like them and we look like them. And a lot of the rules that we put into place, the guy, the guy's talking about like grace. And he just wrote, um, he just wrote a book on head coverings for women. All right. Talking about adding law, like, come on, he's adding all kinds of law. Like he, he is a legalist. You can see it in all of his tweets. You don't have to take my word for it. Go on to his Twitter and look at all the rules that he says all these Christians have to follow in order to be faithful. Like, uh, what he's trying to do here is separate himself, but he can't because it's the same thing. Bill Gothard, Dale Partridge, they believe the same 
theology. And maybe it looks a little bit different. And obviously, like the the morality of like the individual, I'm not saying is the same between those people. Like Bill Gothard was an abuser. I'm not saying anything close to that for Dale Partridge. Um, like, I'm also not saying he's a perfect person. Oh, I want that on the record. <laughs> I was a little too positive. Uh, but um, like they're not the same person, but they have the same theology. Um, yeah. And uh, Joel Webin would be a part of that, too. Uh, have you done a video about Joel Webb and yet his tweet last week about death to complementarianism? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, I've, I've done some videos about, uh, Joel Webb right response ministries. I've talked a few times about him. Uh, you can look in some of the playlists and find stuff like that, but yeah, it's all the same stuff. All this biblical patriarchy, all this stuff of Doug Wilson. It's the same thing. Mark Driscoll, same thing. It's all this weird view of headship and it isn't headship. It's not biblical headship. Biblical headship is about responsibility. It's not about power. And he they're all about power and influence and, and ruling, but ruling with love. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, now, uh, we do have another thing that I want us to talk about. But in order to do that, we got to go to Fundyville. And bring it on down to Fundy. Fundy. Okay, so this was something that I meant to bring up on my stream on Friday about shiny happy people. And if you haven't watched that, go and watch it, um, like the documentary. Go and check out the documentary on Amazon, at least up here in Canada, that's where it's at. Um, but uh, I forgot to bring this up, that the Duggars, Jim, Bob, and Michelle, uh, they decided to put out a statement the, on the day that that documentary series dropped. So I uh, thought it was interesting uh, the recent documentary that talks about our family is sad because in it we see the media and those with ill intentions hurting people we love. Not Josh, but hurting like it's the intentions of the media. Hurting people we love, like other families, ours too, has experienced the joys and heartbreaks of life just in a very public format. This documentary... Documentary... Uh, this documentary paints so much and so many in a derogatory and sensationalized way because sadly, that's the direction of entertainment these days. The idea of like these people talking about, oh, entertainment these days. You mean how you exploited your kids for years and made millions off of it? Like, and for the entertainment of people? We have always believed that the best chance to repair damaged relationships or to reconcile differences is through love in a private setting. We love every member of our family and will continue to do all we can to have a good relationship with each one. Uh, though both uh, through both the triumphs and the trials, we have clung to our faith all the more and discovered that through the love and grace of Jesus, we find strength, comfort, and purpose. <sighs> Welcome to Gaslight City, y'all. <laughs> like that's that's what's happening here. It's just like, oh, we're being we're being persecuted. Oh, the media is trying to get us. They're just showing the things that we said and we did. Oh, it's so bad. Like, come on. Like I, they did have to come out with a statement, right? Like they had to. It's a huge documentary. I didn't realize how big it was going to be, but it's a big documentary. Lots of people care about this, and it's an important one too. And they just wanted to make sure that they came out with the statement. And basically, it's just blaming. It's just blaming them, uh, the media and the documentary makers, and saying that they have love for their family. And this is a constant thing with fundamentalists once like division has happened. They love them, but they love them from afar. They don't call them. They don't talk to them. Uh, it's the same thing that I've experienced in leaving IFB world. Um, you know, like you run into these people like, oh yeah, it's great to see you. And it's like, well, you know, you still have my email, you see me on Twitter, you could have talked to me anytime, but it's the funny way is to pray for them, just pray for them and, uh, never talk about them and never talk to them. <laughs> like, like that's, that's what you do in funny world to reconcile. Uh, so it's just interesting that they were coming out with this statement on that day and basically blaming everyone else and saying, we're, we, we just love Jesus and we're clinging to him. And we all have our struggles. We all have our struggles. 
okay, but not everyone struggles in that way. <laughs> like, no, it's not like we are, we've all made those same mistakes. We don't have kids in prison for, you know, what, like ownership, take ownership. We have like, even if they came out and said like, we've, you know, we've made mistakes as parents, at least be something, but nope, 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 nope. No need for that. Uh, let's end things up with the penalty box. You want to see a penalty? I'll show you a real penalty. Get out of my face, man. All right. Haven't done this in a bit. Uh, let's see. Yeah, we got time. All right, uh, so let's start off with our first one. Let's see what, what's in here in the penalty box. Two minute minor trip, and there's a call. All right, so this is on the video about the Bible thumping wingnut guy and my response to him. Uh, and this is from guitarist. Uh, John MacArthur's accomplishments speak for themselves. He's a man who preaches Christ. Then there's all the social media guys who desperately want to be noticed. I want to seem relevant by latching on to someone who actually is legitimately making an impact and trying to cash in on someone else's accomplishments. One, you will notice that there are no ads on my YouTube because even though I could, I have not monetized my channel. So I don't make any money on this channel. So just let that be said. These people who are like, oh, you're in it for the cash. You just want views. Like you didn't see an ad, did you? Um, but also... Uh, isn't that what the Bible thumping wingnut guy just does? Like he's, he's all about, you know, just having him like, well, I don't know why you're coming at me for it, but you know, okay. Thanks guitarist. See you next time. There's the whistle. There's no excuse there. He knows that whistle has been blown. Uh, interesting that I've had quite a few people comments on this short lately. And again, whenever I get comments on shorts, uh, it's never good. It's never good in real life. It's never good. In that was that was a dumb joke. <laughs> it's never good on that. Uh, Justin Peters is a fundamentalist. Uh, KN, this guy is where? Is he claiming to be a Christian? What is his point? If you are a fundamentalist, you are wrong. I pray he gets his beliefs in order before the return of Jesus, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. <laughs> Being a fundamentalist is wrong. It is. Like, I, I have many many videos on my channel all about that that you can find can uh but yes that is my point and my point is that justin peters is a fundamentalist he was saying in the context of that video he was saying that um you know two people um uh, maybe maybe that were interested in uh how should i put this uh teaching and passion and had a podcast about that teaching and passion and talked about you know drinking while they were talking about teaching and passion on this podcast. Uh, I think that's probably what he was referring to and talking about uh, them having some, some whiskey while they talk theology as if that's a horrible thing and it's causing all these people to go straight to hell for it. Um, yeah, it's, he's a fundamentalist and I called him out on it and apparently nobody likes that I did because they all love him. They just love him. He's, he's a, he's a fan favorite, you know? Following play is under review. Well, just more of like, dang, I'm disappointed in you. Uh, but someone that I actually like uh, sharing Mark Driscoll's tweets and being like, oh, this is great. You know, like some some gif about this is great. And I was just like, why are you doing this? <laughs> like, you could go and find this from anyone else. And they're just like, well, you know, the characterizations of him, you know, aside, this is still truth. It's like, then go and get that truth from somebody else. Like, if you think like Mark Driscoll's teachings are right which you're wrong but even if you're like some of the things you like him like when he talks about i don't know talks about the cross i remember listening to mark driscoll sermons back in the day and really enjoying how he talked about the cross and uh it being impactful to me you can find that stuff from someone else <laughs> like you're not stuck welcome to the internet you can go and find anybody and any of their sermons any of their writings and you can follow them and get all their stuff for free, by the way. And you don't have to be tied to someone like this with all, like, even if you're like, oh, you know, I agree with him. You really want to be tied to that thing. Like, this is my problem, too, with like the Paige Patterson and Johnny Hunt stuff with talking about like the SBC. Why do you want to hitch yourself to that wagon? Like, there's so many people that you can go and find. And, you know, you can find people talking about the same stuff and you don't have all the baggage of their character. Like, come on. 
All right. That's it. That's it. That's it for the penalty box. That's it for the show. Uh, thanks for hanging out with me. I appreciate it. Listening to me rant about these things. It's always a shock to me that you guys, you guys care. Like, and lately you guys have like really cared and what's in who knows. Join me. Imagine what we could accomplish together. I'm just saying that's the creepiest thing I can do. Anyways, I will see you later on in the week at some point. Have a good rest of your Monday guys. See ya.